Welcome. Glad to have you guys here. Um, what we're here to talk about today is safe systems with Linux. This is a bit of a great, whole, you know, this is sort of a, a good goal for us, right? We're really trying to get there. Um, my name is Kate Stewart. I work at the Linux Foundation. Um, I'm the VP of Dependable Embedded Systems. And then my colleague here is Philip Amon, and he's working um, at ETAS, GPA, Germany, and he is also the TSC chair for the ELISA project. And so what we're going to talk to you about is some of the progress we've been making towards this and what's been going on. So we know Linux is already being used in safety critical systems today. Um, it's in the news. It's there. Um, the challenge is for us is going to be okay, where and how. And is the right level of analysis really happening that we can take these things to scale and then share the analysis? So the first thing to keep in mind is what is actually functional safety. And functional safety is the freedom from unacceptable risk. Risk is still there potentially. Of physical injury or of damage to health of people, either directly or indirectly because of damage to property or the environment. So functional safety is making sure that the equipment is operating in response to its impacts, inputs in a way that is going to be avoiding dangerous conditions. And so this is what we're trying to figure out, how we can work with Linux in a way that will allow us to mitigate consequences and reduce issues with hazardous events. So in functional safety, you expect the software does behave as it's specified, does not interfere or impair with other components, and all possible erroneous events, i.e., when something goes wrong, is it going to do the right thing? Having a, you know, a crash and a log file sometimes is just not acceptable in certain carriers where there's a safety involved. And then you need to basically, once you've made sure you're good, you have to have the evidence to prove it to someone else. You have to have another set of eyes on it to basically verify that, yes, it really is going to happen and it has a good chance. So the same way we say more eyes makes bugs shallow, more eyes makes things safe. So these are the safety standards, main safety standards that are out there today. 61508 is sort of the generic standard we've been working with, but you'll see variants in the medical device space, in the avionics space, um, and then 262662, which is a really key one for the automotive space, is using a lot of the same underlying analysis as is the industrial, railways, machine safety, nuclear industry, agricultural. So the heart of these things is um, you know, requirements, documentation, and testing, and proving it, creating evidence that the system is going to be safe in a way that you can convince someone else. The slight rigor on the demands is going to differ from standard to standard. Unfortunately, all of these standards are behind paywalls, for the most part, of about $5,000 a pop, which makes it pretty much yeah, unless you're at a company where this is you know, part of what you can have access to, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily accessible to open source developers, especially when some maintainer is working on a subsystem and his company doesn't care at all about this area. But um, you know, how do we actually make these things accessible to everyone is one of the challenges here. So at the heart of those standards, though, they're basically trying to increase system quality. Okay? System quality is about the code doing what you think it's going to do. So having requirements, knowing you can trace it, having the evidence after you've tested it, and documenting it. Realistically, that's what they're trying to do, is, which is part of a mechanism for making sure another set of eyes can look at the problem. So in ELISA, we've basically got a community that's come together um, that wants to focus on these types of topics. And we're working with other communities at the Linux Foundation, the Linux kernel obviously being one of them, because once we're working in that way, but like the Zen project, the Zephyr project, SPDX, Yocto, Kernel CI, and AGL projects. And we're trying to create reproducible systems so we can start to reason about these things in a structured way, and more people can tell us we're wrong. And we can try to refine and evolve the knowledge. And so we're looking at the elements, um, some of the processes, some of the tools that are involved here. And this project, you know, we can't ensure someone's specific system to be safe. We're trying to find a sort of like, uh, here's some methodologies, here's some processes we can apply, such that it isn't one, just one kernel at a point in time. It's if you're getting the Linux kernel, what things should you try to take into account so that when you actually go to ship something with whatever version of the kernel you are on, you know how to start applying things. And there's other people that are trying to collaborate on this too. So it's creating a peer network to try to solve this problem together. So we've got working groups in there for, on the architecture of the kernel 
and looking at the safety implications of existing subsystems. We're looking at features of Linux, the options and configs. Um, we've got tooling to help do the analysis. We've got the engineering process group to look at how this stuff should all be applied. And then we have a systems group, which Philip will go into more detail on, which is looking at, let's create a reference open system so that people could, like the same way AGL has it for some of their stuff, we want a reference open system that people can take and move to their hardware and basically be able to have things roughly integrated and then share the analysis around it. So we have working groups aligned with various verticals. We have an aerospace working group that Boeing leads and they're in the process of forming a space grade Linux initiative. So if anyone is interested in space um, and Linux being used up in there, please come talk to me and I'll point you at it. We'll be having our first workshop in this area at NASA in um, Goddard Space Center in December. So that is going to be coming up. Um, we have the work going on with AGL in collaboration and we've been working with an open APS system for looking at medical devices and some of the implications of that standard in those spaces. So what we do is, is we use these working groups to serve, help us understand system stories and then basically these other working groups take the data from that and work to help create deliverables to help advance the best state of technology for working with this, these problem sets. So with that, some of our existing deliverables are the system group and we want to reprove the whole system, so I will let Philip tell you about it. Yes, thanks a lot. So uh, you saw the different horizontal and vertical parts and exactly the systems work group bring these pieces together. So we saw the demand, first of all, to set our Linux focus work into a context of a system because safety at the end is a system property and you may miss very important elements if you don't respect the environment around it. But we also wanted that whatever results we produce are getting visible and being experienced by others. And often you go maybe to a fair or somewhere you get a company visiting you and they show you like here's our great demonstrator. And then you come in and say okay what does it take to reproduce this demonstrator? And what you typically get is maybe still an SD card with a downloadable image. Or you can download it from a server, whatever, but it's typically pre-made. And the thing is, it's very hard to reproduce, to come to the same conclusions. And for this, what we have done is, we worked on a CI system where really a strong queue of dependency comes in. So we use sources within the systems work group, uh, which are getting pulled within the Docker file or getting mentioned there. Then the Docker file creates the Docker image. And our GitLab CI then takes exactly this image, which you would also download, and create the binaries for it, the images, which are then ending up on the target. You can see a Silinx device here, which we use for the systems, because there then Zephyr and Linux are involved on the smaller part below, there is this alternative setup which is basically QMO based and shows this AGL instrument cluster which you have seen on the previous page. And this is really the base for where we see the work in. Uh, what's currently missing because this hardware is super expensive, it's like 3,000, 5,000, it's in the range of three to five thousand dollars. So we are currently seeing it's great to see AGL for example with Raspberry Pi 5. If we make this available there, there's recent work also where you can experience Xan and Zephyr exactly on these systems, also on hardware, also on Raspberry Pi 5. This may be a way to go. Or we may look into uh, this kind of setup for server sites, like uh, using uh, the CI and then take ARM service, like we've also seen with AGL. Yeah. All should still be there also as a QMO image that you just take this down. This is still in the development, but it would be very nice to just download the image which we have built and you can experience. And this you can really decide, do I just want to experience something? Do I want to change the development environment? Or do I want to build things from scratch? And a lot of work also here relies on the Yocto project. So uh, you can see this, that is like being used in many industries. So it's kind of the standards typically taken to create any kind of devices, not only safety critical, but mainly also all other electronics, consumer electronics, automotive electronics. And that's where you typically also get your vendor BSP from. So you will find Yocto support basically on every new SOC which comes out. And 
it improves a lot on the feature set. So you have reproducible builds being enabled, which is important because you need to make sure whatever you build is actually the same thing. How do you want to convince someone at the end that what you've produced is the same if the binary is not looking identical, right? And this could be sometimes just simple time stems which make things different. And then, yeah, you need a lot of testing around these kind of things and also get then S-bombs created. And for example, we switched on the inherit SPDX within the Octo parts that with our build of the AGL, you also get the S-bomb out of it. And we are in the process of extending this to Zephyr and then so that you really can get a system S-bomb. And this is just one example which I had from the CI. Uh, we also currently progress like a minimal kernel configuration, which has been used by Boeing. So this get built on a regular base and yeah, the ASPOM I already mentioned. So you can all see this, there's a link in the bottom. It's easy to experience. And one of the first things of the feature deliverables which we brought in, and uh, this was dynamic workload tracing because we were doing like system analysis. We went down the systems and at some point we figured out that we can model a lot of things, but we need to understand what's going on in the system dynamically. So for this, we switched on tracing, looking like what subsystem calls were being made. And first we had this internally for the medical devices, and then we used the medical devices part getting into the automotive work group that we could also trace there. And it was such a good work that we were also able to upstream this in the kernel documentation where uh, Shua and Shefali were doing the work and they're still maintaining it. So thank a lot for this. I see you being here, Shua. It's very great. This is on the dynamic view. Uh, but we also have like a static view because by the dynamic you see what's happening but you may not see what's left and right and you want to see what system calls are actually not called, what are relations to it, where do things go. And for this we have the kernel static analysis navigator where you can do different configurations, different views, you have a graphical representation uh, which creates currently a lot of static views also in the way of interacting it but you can just see like, okay, what am I using? What is my parent call? Where is the sub calls are going on? And this really makes life much easier to really see what parts you use. But you need to know what are you really using there? And for this, you should write down any kind of needs, constraints, whatever you have, or let's simply call it like your, what you require with your requirements. And there are many, many tools around there which handle requirements, but we're talking about source code, right? So you need to get some traceability to sources and you need to also write this down and it should be open source. And one tool which we came up with, it's called Bazel, um, and you, we have a server running on this as well. You have a nice seminar available which you can follow so I don't talk too much about this if you think like oh I'm interested in like managing my requirements traceability um, find like how I create testable requirements definition and how do I can I decompose the system to write things down this can help you a lot this tool and it can also be used to identify gaps on tracking and tracking the progress where you still have to look into and later in this presentation we come to like how do we get actually requirements into the kernel because currently you do not find really requirements, specification, definition, information in the kernel. So um, we have a few more words on requirements as we start having it. I guess that's going to Kate. Sure. Um, so when you're talking about those standards, um, they have the notion of there's various needs that have to happen at a system level and then they're met by requirements on the code, so they, they're expecting the code to do something, okay? So there, a, there may be a, a series of needs and they connect up into this hierarchy through all their dependencies to really understand what's going on. And this is the way these standards have worked for a while, okay? They have this aspect of various levels of requirements and needs and then basically recursively work your way down to get all the functionality covered. Our challenge is, that the open source components aren't speaking that language that the safety space has been talking about. So all of a sudden, the analysis sort of breaks down at certain places. And so the challenge now becomes is, okay, how can we actually start getting it so we can do the reasoning inside databases at scale? Okay, that's my goal here. 
is we need to be able to start having this, this knowledge web effectively created so that we can get to the stage of understanding if something, like if a vulnerability happens in one of those open source components, what are the implications on the system? Okay, that's what's missing right now. So, you know, each patch being added to the Linux kernel has a what and why. There was a reason it was put in, okay? But it wasn't captured in a systemic way. It was captured in mailing list discussions and it hasn't been surfaced. And then, quite frankly, you know, as people change jobs, things get forgotten, we've got technical debt that is starting to emerge. And people don't necessarily understand what's happening in a part of code. And you get these parts of code where people don't want to go close to <laughs> because, you know, figuring out what's actually happening there is challenging. So the what um, the code is expected to do in a machine-readable form is a challenge. So if we can start to, start to surface this up, that gives us something to hook onto for um, doing the testing and actually understanding that if there's a patch updated, might I be affected or not? And if I'm affected, is it participating in some of those requirements we were talking about earlier? And so linking the code and the tests to the requirements will give us this traceability that we've been lacking and quite frankly, improve the quality of the kernel um, because we will have a way of start to address some of the system technical debt that's sitting there right now. And so, you know, how can multiple tools um, share this linked information? Um, and, you know, how does basically when Linux is being used in a system with other RTOSs, with multiple instances of Linux, with different parameters, how can we actually start to reason about this in an efficient fashion? And the key is going to be efficiency here. Because right now it's big piles of paper and spreadsheets and all sorts of other lovely systems and lots of proprietary tools. At least that's what our friends in the safety space tell us. <laughs> so. What we sort of came up with um, after uh, Linux plumbers earlier this year, and um, Philip will go into more details on that, is you know, what are the requirements for requirement traceability for the Linux kernel? And the first thing is obviously to be machine readable. Um, you know, from the discussions um, at uh, plumbers, the preference in the room was to basically embed some sort of requirement in the code, keep it close to where it needs to live, so it's um, not falling all over in a side tool somewhere else have some sort of unique ID that could potentially evolve. So if a requirement changes because we've got something wrong, we want to know and we want to maybe advance it. Be able to reference a requirement for multiple files in code. Sometimes a requirement takes things in multiple files that have to participate. So we need to be able to basically do that cross-linking. And right now we need to be able to hook those requirements up to test. So the test framework's in kernel CI. So that group is busy looking at working with us on how we can get this better. Because quite frankly, that'll give much more informed testing too. It won't be just throwing everything at it. It'll be, oh, we've changed this. Okay, we know that these tests are relative to that. And so this is what we have to rerun. And we should be able to detect, you know, if code has changed that might be interacting with this requirement and be able to do some analysis to decide if additional testing has to happen or the requirement needs to be updated. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Philip to talk about what, what we happened at Plumbers last in September. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, basically on these requirements where we start of bringing in a safe systems microconference into plumbers. And the agenda was covering multiple topics. So we were going into system static analysis. You'll see a bit of it what we have already touched in this presentation. So this is basically the static analysis and the requirements traceability part with the tools. But things like uh, yeah, a little bit of code coverage, then uh, how systems look into what could be specific when you are creating something. Also the software bill of material. Well, these are topics which we haven't touched yet, but these are also all respond or important for creating things. And the last part on the documentation of requirements, I put an exclamation mark for the discussion. Maybe we have also some time at the end to talk about this. Just the first presentation which was in there was on the word I.O. and like it's saying verifying the conformance of the word IO driver to the word IO specification. This was very interesting to see because there is actually a specification for word IO and it has several hundred of pages written by people, some of them native speakers, some of them are non-native speaker, and still there's always an issue in how to interpret these things, how to read this. And uh, there was a proposal to have a more formal specification to follow a formal language like we know from programming, right? At the end, computer programming language are kind of formal languages. 
And this can be very important, especially also even if you're following specification, it was said that if you read the hardware specification, it may even say something which is not acting like the reality and therefore formal description can help. And it was also the proposal to say like, can we extract like natural language models to create formal requirements out of it? This can also give us a plausibility check how things are and ease our work. So as a next step for these activities, there was a proposal to come to definition of SASA specification and to also find a good place. And this is actually like what we also have for the Linux kernel. We say, what is the right place to put the requirements? How do we make sure they get maintainable, right? Another session in there was on the source code base or code base coverage for the Linux kernel. This was more on uh, yeah, explaining a lot of things. It was just we had 15 minutes on this one. It's not long, but um, there was a very long presentation with like 100 plus slides. If you're really interested in like how to come to coverage, uh, just check for the Make Linux Fly. We also had a webinar on this in the past. And yeah, but the thing is, they come up with a coverage tool in comparison to GCAF and KCAF, which is more reliable to the source and better traceable. And this is put on uh, as a patch proposal on the mailing list. And the idea is to get this patch mainline. And as we're talking about kernel CI, was also to get in this into the kernel CI maybe to have a continuous testing in there. For then for the tracing of whatever you have in tests, we also need to have an S bomb. And the main argumentation is you should buy products you trust in, right? You would normally when you are allergic, for example, or if you have any dietary restrictions, you very often check the ingredients and you trust the ingredients. And if you're not able to read what's written there, or if you come to a supplier which you're not doing, so maybe you take supply of choice. And yeah, information is also heavily spread. So maybe you will check uh, if you are in a project, you have your repos, you have directories, files, Excel sheets, Word documents, notes somewhere. So it's spread all over and it's like, how to find these things. And today the tool is often put everything in a large spreadsheet like Excel or so. I think we have far too much use of it still in the safety space and we need to get better traceable. So here is a proposal to say use as bombs in this. And then uh, also say, show as we have SPDX safety profile work group which meets on Fridays to a very Japanese unfriendly time I would say. Uh, but there's also a way of just contributing to the community via mails and in discussions. There is also a um, once a week in a much more once a month in a Japanese friendly time. There is a call where we talk about topics around SPDX that are interesting to people. And if people are interested in this a safety, what's happening on safety, um, by all means reach out to me and we'll introduce it to an agenda of one of the monthly calls. So we can talk, go details on that because the other main person in this group is Nicole, well, the lead of the group is Nicole as well, Poplar, and she's out of Germany, so it'll either be one or the other of us, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And uh, yeah, these were the main parts directly from Plumbers before we come to the requirements topic, but I also want to mention that at Plumbers we had a very intense discussion with the Colonel CI people, and uh, yeah, that actually you may be knowing a Colonel CI and may using it, and the reason why it's there, it's just like it checks essential parts. It checks test cases which you rely on. But the question is, how do we know what the test is really intended? Where is the test specification? And what does it testing against it, right? Because it could be that there is a test of no use or it could be something missing. And how do we track down the specification of it? And therefore, we are currently looking like how do we get this kind of traceability model? Could there be a relation with the Basel tool for requirements? And uh, how do we put the requirements? What could we integrate? Could we bring kernel CI also into our reference system so that you can directly get testable kernel configuration there? And yeah, this is like the activities around kernel CI, which was actually not touched in the microconf, but along with plumbers. And yeah, so much said about the requirements. So I want to come to the like proposal of what we have discussed so far. It's uh, basically in a very recent discussion. So it's really work in progress. Nothing put in stone or so. Um, we sort of, it could be good to follow the 
SPDX way of doing it because a lot of files in the kernel have the SPDX identifier and we said why not just go there and put something like SPDX rec for requirements and then basically have three different types in there. You can see there I put in header, text and node. The header basically helps you to identify, have a unique identification of it, uh, whatever implementation you do of it. Then you write some text what you really intend with the requirement and you may find something useful to be added, some additional information and then you just add a node. And you can spread this at multiple locations. So you can put it in front of functions where you may want to document and you can put it in sub-functions or somewhere within parts. If you're going too deep you should consider is it really the right place to put things and the nice thing about having these identifiers is really like you can grab through the tree, you can find it, you can create databases of it and by this you also come to very good traceability, you can link the test cases and and, and one of the things that's needed here is we're going to be trying to get, do this upstream in the tree so that quite frankly the maintainers are going to have to accept it and they're going to have to tell us yes this is actually doing what we think it should be doing when we actually put the requirement in. So we've got people who are in our community that are very experienced in writing requirements and having the precision. This is not something that the kernel maintainers generally do but hopefully they'll review what's being created and then give us feedback to say, yeah, you're up to lunch. <laughs> so, um, or uh, yeah, no, that's close enough. Okay, I'll accept this into the code. What we're trying to do is keep the load on the maintainers as low as possible here. And so that the people who have the expertise in trying to, and who are having to do this for their job, okay? Because their companies are trying to sell a safe product or a safe component, something like that. And they're having to do this analysis anyhow, but this way we can get more eyes on it and we can get the precision. So whether it's this syntax or something else, um, like I say, this is a starting point and I'm just curious right now if we've got the microphone handy, if there's anyone who has any comments. I know we had a couple of maintainers that said they would look at our proposal. We haven't sent it out to the mailing list yet because um, we have basically been trying to noodle and then try, frankly corral ourselves a little bit in terms of will, will something like this work from a safety perspective first before we start having the discussion because there's no point in going something that's not going to do the eventual goal. But this, one's, this is the first starting point. So I don't know if anyone has any comments or wants to talk about this. Oh, we've got a, we've got a hand up to second then. Do we have the microphone? Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks for the call. So my name is Vincent. I am a maintainer of uh, the CAN subsystem in Good. Linux. Um, yeah, the first question I have, like you spoke about uh, Bazel with an S, so I was familiar with <laughs> Bazel with a Z by Google, so I wanted to know if the name was a coincidence, and maybe if there is a bit more background of this tool, like uh, uh, as far as I see, it seems that you created this tool for this need, so yeah. uh, what was missing for the other alternatives, so, and why did you decide to create this one? Okay, so Red Hat basically, ended up needing a tool uh, that was out, out in the open and they came up with this. What they were doing was mining the man pages for the kernel to try to understand what should be happening from the man page perspective and capturing it and then doing the mappings to the code and testing. And so they had this internal tool and we went, okay, we've got doors, we've got JAMA, we've got all these other ones, why don't we do something out in the open? And they were receptive and so they open sourced what they had. Basil was the internal name. We knew it overlapped with Basil from Google. Um, unfortunate, but um, we went with the name because the, the, the creators of the tool get to decide the name as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, okay, so it's more coincidental then. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, it has the Azel word in there, which is like from automotive, and it was an Italian guy who made a Basil out of it and saw that some kind of spice which is needed to get things forward. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And so if I know, want to know more about this uh, Bazel thing, uh, is it, uh, where can I find, uh, did you put the link? If I you, don't if remember. You just, yeah. yeah, if you want yeah. to get more details on it, you just go do, to elisa.tag resources and then there is a direct link to Bazel repo, the documentation, and also you can find the presentation material, the documentation, webinar things, or seminar yeah. parts. We're doing well, thanks to Philip, it's even uploaded already. 
Uh, thanks a lot. And maybe my last question: On which mailing list are you posting? Uh, um, we want to probably see about setting up one for this, and so we'll probably set something up. Um, hopefully, Thomas or Steve or someone in the, or Shua or someone in the community can help us get a list started for people that people self-subscribe to, um, so that we can actually have this discussion. Constantine. Ask Constantine. Okay, fine. I'll just. But that's what you do. That's how we do it. That's how you're doing? Okay, fine, I can ask Constantine. That's yeah. easy enough. Uh, I'll be looking at that. Uh, if you want, you can send an announce to Linux Can. Uh, yep. The day is done, and maybe there will be other people interested. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, go for it. How to find an SPDD there? Ah, uh, yeah, a typo. Good, thank you. Good eyes. So that, that you must be working on safety. <laughs> that kind of typo must be detected somewhere. Good details are important. Thank you very much for noticing that typo. We'll fix it in the slides. <laughs> and, and like I said, it's like I said, we don't. Know. Yeah, it, that one is an optional one, but it's the exit. We, we, we want to have a standard header that we can grep for equivalently. Okay, that was part of the whole idea. Yeah, and we probably need another piece from that. You basically say, hey. Um, this is actually the go look at for this identifier because that's what's actually being used here to for different files to another file. So we've got a bit more syntax to figure out before we can you know have some discussions there. But we're so we've, if you're interested, just basically send me your email and I'll add you to the ad hoc thread right now, and then we'll have the mailing list as soon as we're, we we not, we're not going to get completely shot down. Any other questions or thoughts? Go for it. Oops, where'd it go? Oh, there, uh, this is Nagaima from Nissan Motor. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this is uh, not a uh, link to your technical uh, point. Uh, I would like to uh, ask your uh, opinion about uh, recent some government uh, announced uh, they want to ban some certain uh, country's software uh, if that is not open. Uh -huh. So it's mean uh, uh, your uh, our SPDX format is uh, considered mm -hmm. such government intention. So how how can we uh, the support the government intention the, with our format? Uh, could you get my point? Uh, do you make sense? Not quite uh, sure. The, I get if you, yeah. the government uh -huh. certain government don't want to use the SPDX, we need to change our uh, okay. Well, format. I, 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 like I say. If the government doesn't want to use SPDX, maybe ask, get me to talk to them or put yeah. me in touch with talking to the person. So, yeah. Because realistically, we've been doing a lot of thinking about safety mm. with SPDX, and the other formats have not. Yeah. And the nice thing is, if we actually do this right, you generate a source level SBOM when you're building, so you know exactly which files make it into your image. And then you have the requirements over here on the side and the traceability of the requirements. So you actually have a way of putting this all into a database and reasoning about it. So for security down the road, you have to update a patch. Like say, the rate of change, I think, on the kernel for bug fix well, patches and so forth on the backports is like about one an hour was the last number I had heard. It may have changed slightly. I don't, I'm not sure. But the fact that you're trying to keep up with that, well, realistically, most of those things are happening in a wide spread of areas. If those things aren't sitting in the parts you're caring about, you don't have to care about it if you know that's, that file isn't important there. And we need to get to that stage for being able to be precise about what's actually happening. And quite frankly, reduce a lot of stupid work. There's a lot of stupid work. There's a lot of false positives. And trying to keep up with things on the kernel side, um, we need to be smarter. Yeah. Uh, this is the way. Yes. Uh, each company couldn't uh, communicate uh, with the government co correctly. Yeah. So that's the reason why the, the following the format that is uh, uh, compliance to the uh, government intention. Such a situation. Yeah. I, like I, I'm seeing some yeah. SBOM formats emerge from India. I have been reading one from, um, there was one I saw from India. There's obviously the German one. There's one from the US. Um, what the minimum elements are is always changing. Um, but harmonizing it and making sure that we are trying to catch what they're trying to go after, even if we're using the field's name slightly differently, uh, is something we are committed to doing in SPDX so that all the information can be there. If you actually go look at the AI bomb, and you know, Linux is being used with a whole bunch of AI systems too, right? We're going to have to have that AI component being th thought about as well. Um, you know, we have been doing work on you know, comparing to the, for the EU AI Act, as well as the F FDA Act stuff in the US, as well as the IEEE AI ethics standards. There's standards and work going on. So um, we can certainly look at, as soon as we 
like I say, I'll be looking at the BSI and I'll be looking at India's on the way home <laughs> and see if there's new fields and we'll probably do it. But the key, I think, for us from the Linux perspective is to have something there that we can mine automatically so that we can start to do the reasoning in a systemic fashion. And, and then I think we can get to a much smarter place than we are today. And, and I think the quality of the quality will improve too. Okay, thank you. I would like thank to you. add from the, from the government perspective, so the thing which I perceive is that they're really looking into standards and open standards. You may have some areas where they don't accept when you don't have an IEEE or whatever standard or IEC or so, so you need to have kind of these really standardization bodies, but we have a lot of possibilities to work on this as well. Like we are also currently looking into like an open source quality standard, not that we require a standard, but we see that a lot of people will be useful of it. And it's actually the open which is driven. So for digital sovereignty, it's really on the open side. And let's say even if there would be a country which say, I, I don't know why they should do, but if they would say, you're not allowed to use SPDX. Oh, you're SPDX not, is not, the nice standard. Use. Yeah, but you it's also- It's already an ISO standard. You also so. don't need, to, I mean, yeah. this is what we say, uh -huh. Most likely, if you are working in the kernel space, you don't want to do the SPDX part for you, the requirements work. You would simply just grab for the tag. It does, mm -hmm. It's just an identifier, and this identifier yeah. helps you without the full tooling. So I guess most likely nobody will say, you are not allowed to use these four letters in your code, right? So this is yeah. like, They're already your, the question was on a wider level, but I want to bring it on this. They're using it for licenses right now. And so it's, it's pervasive in the kernel array, which is why we thought this pattern might work here too. Yeah. Okay, so I think, I think we're, we got, we're just about out of time, so we probably... Yeah, we have another two it. minutes, thank I you guess. For the I saw input. this three minutes warning, it's two minutes to go. Um, I jumped quickly on the parts, or one part which I missed. I wanted to uh, say that we have a bunch of companies which are really involved from all over the globe, and that it's really important that we document what is safe, and this is the key in there, and if you want to get more on this, there is a bunch of seminars exactly for this documentation of things to train. So on the, all the fields from technical to like the real time and all this work on how you can trade things with Kragit and the token and you find all this in the knowledge base of Elisa, you can get in touch with us. And yeah, if you look on the uploaded slides, you find the same link also for the other projects which you've mentioned. So you can really get all the information uh, you need as a starting point. And I guess by this we may have the last question or so before oh. we are ending up. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll be around for the next couple of days. So please feel free to reach up to either of us. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. And any of the kernel maintainers who want to come and talk to us more about this proposal, we would welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.